on Easter Sunday uh, in, in my, the message, I, I preached that uh, Sunday morning, I, I talked about uh, some heroes I had as, as a kid. I talked about sometimes on these uh, TV shows I watched, the heroes weren't really people, they were cars. And I told this story about a uh, hero, the car from Knight Rider named Kit. And somebody stopped me on the way out of worship that day. And it was, a, you know, I was surprised by who it was. Uh, you know, there are some folks that I anticipate connecting their around the same age, they maybe had the same interests, they kind of that same background I have. Uh, there are some folks that you expect to sort of connect with these stories, and this particular person I wasn't necessarily expecting to really connect with this, but they stopped me on the way out and they said, okay, so you know who Kit is from Knight Rider, do you know who Carr is from Knight Rider. And I said, of course I know who Carr is. I, I, I barely passed algebra. I can't really spell, but I know 1980s and 1990s television trivia. And so I know that Carr is the villain in, in Knight Rider, the alter ego of, of Kit. And, uh, and so we talked about that for a little bit. And it got me thinking that, you know, these heroes are heroes for a reason in, in television and movies and uh, books and, and, and at least part of the reason that these heroes are heroes is because they have a counterpart, because they have a, a villain that is, is, you know, opposing them. And so I, I just wanted to share a few of my favorite villains with you, okay? And, and so these are in no particular order and for no particular reason necessarily, just some of my favorite villains from, that I remember from uh, watching movies and TV and that sort of thing. The first villain here is, is Elmer Fudd. Uh, he never could, uh, you know, track down that rabbit, and Elmer Fudd is, is one of my favorite villains. I just think, I, I never really got into hunting, because I'm pretty sure that if I was a hunter, I would be Elmer Fudd, you know, just always missing out on, on that... Uh, on, on that prey that I was searching for. Uh, the next uh, a villain here is the Joker from Batman. The Joker first appeared in comic books in 1940. And I kind of picked this uh, Jack Nicholson Joker because through the years, the Joker has gotten more and more creepy as you go along. And, and so this is from a, a, a little less creepy era of the Joker, but one of my favorite villains. The next villain, I had to look up this guy's name because this villain, I just always, you know, the sensei, this guy from Karate Kid, right? His name was evidently in the movie John Kreese. He was, uh, you know, the, the guy who said, no mercy, show no mercy, right? In uh, the karate tournament. And, and uh, these, uh, there's a, this service, this app or whatever, I, I think it's called Cameo. I'm not really sure. I'm not promoting any cameo services, but you can order, you know, from semi-famous people, you can order recordings, like for your voicemail or whatever, and you can, you can order up John Kreese to say, uh, no mercy on your voicemail if you so desire. So just for your information. My, my last uh, villain here is maybe the most famous villain in, in movie history, perhaps. Uh, uh, my daughter Zoe is graduating from high school, recently told me, hey, Dad, I, I think I know what I want for graduation. I said, really, what's that? She said, a lightsaber. <laughs> like, oh, huh. I remember when you got a dictionary for graduation, right? You, you know, or, or go big. Think car, but no lightsaber. That's what she wants. But uh, maybe because Darth Vader is one of the most famous villains of all time. And we have these villains that we, we remember because of their opposition to the hero. And, and uh, I suppose we're introduced to the villain in Scripture right away, this opposition to the hero in Scripture. We, we learn about in Genesis chapter 3 when, when Satan tempts Adam and Eve and we see the enemy play out and, and go to great lengths. Zach talked about the story and all through the story, whether it's you know with Abraham and the struggles he faced or Moses and the uh, people of God and Egypt, all through the Old Testament and the prophets and the rebellion of Israel, we see the enemy do everything he can to stop God's big plan from occurring, to keep the, this hero from showing up on the scene. And, and we have to decide, you know, how will we respond to the enemy? 
I, I think that First John chapter 2, verses 18 to 29, it's an interesting, kind of difficult, challenging section of Scripture, but it raises for us three questions that we need to answer in, in order to determine how we're going to respond to the enemy and God's big story. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open them up to the book of 1 John. We've been working, we, we started last week in verse 15 of chapter 2. We're, we're spending a couple more weeks in, in chapters 2 and 3 here in 1 John this morning. We'll, we'll take a look at these three questions in 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. This is what God's Word says. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge." I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, Then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about everything, and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. All right, an interesting section of scripture, and we're going to dive right into question number one here, which is, who is the Antichrist? Verse 18 uh, says, children, it is the last hour. It is the last hour. It's sort of an an ominous thought, isn't it? It's the last hour. And and we're going to be talking about from really this point on throughout the summer, we're we're going to get through uh, 1 John here and we're going to dive in and, and... about June into the book of Revelation, we're going we're gonna to study, you're going to hear this word from time to time, eschatology, which just means the study of end times. And, and I just think as we approach those things, as we read phrases in scripture like, it is the last hour, we sort of lose our breath a little, right? It's kind of this ominous thought where we maybe approach that with a little uh, trepidation, a little fear, a little anxiety. I I read an article just about some unusual phobias, all right? And I'm going to share a few of these with you. Uh, I'm going to warn you that I'm going to mess these names up, right? These these words are by me, but we're going to do our best, all right? This first phobia is arachibutrophobia, which if I'm saying that close to what it, it, it's supposed to sound like, that's the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. All right, I, I'm not sure who is very anxious about peanut butter sticking to the roof of the mouth, but some people deal with that phobia. Uh, another phobia is, is the nomophobia, which is, sort of sounds like what it is. It, and I, I promise that a few of you suffer from this anxiety a little bit. I, I suffer from this fear on occasion. It's the fear of being without your mobile phone, all right, without your cell phone. So there, there's a little fear. Or globophobia, which is the fear of balloons. I'm not sure how intense that fear can be. This, this uh, phobia, I'm not even going to try to pronounce. I just have it on the screen here, I think. Uh, You can work through this if you'd like, but uh, I'm not going to struggle through it. This is, ironically enough, the fear of long words. (laughs) Literally the longest word in your dictionary will be this phobia, the fear of long words. And and the last one is, uh, I I wasn't sure how many of these phobias to include, but this is decidophobia, the fear of making decisions, all right? You you get these phobias, and uh, I'm not... uh, I, I don't want to poke fun at anybody's anxiety, right? But uh, the, when I read these and think about these phobias, I'm, I'm struck by 
just how little reason we would have to really be afraid of these things. You know, I remember a time in my life when I lived without a cell phone. It can be done. That can be accomplished, right? If you you have peanut butter that sticks to the roof of your tongue, uh, it might be annoying, but it's probably not going to cause you great harm. Uh, Balloons, uh, you know, nothing to really fear there. And when we read phrases like, uh, it is the last hour, and we have these conversations about the end times, and there are so many different ideas and so many different uh, uh, opinions, and, and it can just create some anxiety, and sometimes we really uh, approach this conversation with a little bit of fear. And if you don't, I, I sort of hate it when speakers say this, and I'm about to say this, if you don't hear anything else you know, this morning, hear this. That as followers of Jesus, you are on the victorious team. You don't have anything to fear in this conversation of no matter how ominous the last hour might sound, there's nothing for us to fear. We don't have to be anxious about this thing, uh, uh, the study of the last days or, or having this conversation. We, we get this phrase, it is the last hour, and it's a little bit of an unusual uh, phrase in the New Testament. In fact, it, it really only appears here in 1 John chapter 2. That's the only time we read uh, this last hour. Now, uh, Jesus talks about the last hours are coming on occasion in, in the gospel. But this particular phrase, it is the last hour, is only read here. Most of the time, when writers, uh, really since the prophets in the Old Testament, all through the New Testament, when they talk about, you know, eschatology, when they talk about the end times, they use the phrase last days most often. And when you read that in the prophets, if you just do a word search for last days, you're going to have tons of responses, tons of findings from the from the prophets. And most of the time when you read about the last days in the prophets in the Old Testament, you'll discover that those prophecies were fulfilled in Jesus' first advent, uh, Christmas, when, when he shows up in this world, puts skin on and, and shows up his ministry, his death and resurrection, that, that his life, his first coming fulfills most of those prophecies in the Old Testament and the prophets when they talk about the last days. And yet, writers like John, who kind of substitutes this phrase, the last hour, for that phrase, last days, when writers in the New Testament, they continue to use this phrase. And it sort of begs the question, if Jesus fulfills these Old Testament prophecies, why do they continue to use this phrase in the New Testament? And I think it's because these writers lived in a a now not yet tension as they talk about Jesus, his kingdom that he, he ushers in, in these last days that he ushers in. And, and so they, the writers in the New Testament believe that they're living in these last days, and yet there's this age to come. Jesus' favorite way of talking about the, the last days would be with that phrase of, of ages. He would talk about We're living in this age, and yet there's an age to come, that same tension of now, but not yet. One scholar said it like this. He said, the New Testament writers understood that believers are now in the last days, but there's still an age to come in which all redemptive historical loose ends will be tied up in the final consummation of all things, such as the resurrection of the dead, the final judgment, and the recreation of all things will take place. And so there's this tension of, of now and not yet that uh, the New Testament writers are, are living in and that we're living in today as we read these kinds of phrases like, it is the last hour. Now that sounds especially ominous because uh, John, uh, you know, here in verse 18, we read it, it's translated the last hour. This is just a little bit of, of information that you need to know here. In the Greek, there's no definite article. Uh, 
And so what John is really saying is, he's saying, watch out for these things because these are last hour kinds of events. These are last hour kinds of things. These are last days sorts of happenings. And what are those happenings? Well, he uh, talks about, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. These last days look like this because of of these antichrists. The Greek word there is just like the English. It's it's antichristos. It it literally means opposing Christ, right? An opposition of Christ. So anything that opposes Christ is antichrist. That makes sense. And and yet, as believers, so much of the time, we we approach antichrist kind of like Scooby-Doo, Any of you remember I used to come home from school and watch Scooby-Doo Mysteries? And at the end of the Scooby-Doo Mystery, they'd reveal the the real villain, right? The ghost wasn't really a ghost. It was the owner of the carnival, right? And how would they reveal it? They'd pull the mask off of the real villain, of the real opponent. And that's sort of how uh, we approach this idea of Antichrist. We want to we kind of pull the mask off and, and know who we are looking at. And this isn't new. I mean, uh, we, we've pointed, if, if you go and do a YouTube search of Antichrist, I don't necessarily suggest doing this, uh, because it can be a little worrisome. But if you do that, uh, you'll find you know, people claiming that every dictator in history since Nero is the Antichrist. You know, Somebody will say every president since Reagan or whatever has been or is the Antichrist. And you're going to find all of these folks trying to pull the mask off of who Antichrist is. And it's kind of been built up over time as people talk about it. It's one of those phrases, one of those words that, that is, is in common vernacular even to folks outside of the church. If you say Antichrist, people kind of get it. They kind of know that we're talking about end times kind of stuff. And, and they're going to follow along a little bit with that conversation, with that big, big story, just, just at least a, a, a little bit. But it's a word, so you would think, that it must be, it must show up all through the New Testament. I mean, at every page, you must be reading about Antichrist, and it's just not true. And in fact, you only read that word Antichrist here in 1 John and in 2 John. Now, Paul talks about the man of lawlessness, and, and John in Revelation talks about you know, a dragon and a beast that some people associate with this term Antichrist. But one of the very first things you need to understand about this first question, who is the Antichrist, you need to know that this is a really limited conversation that the Apostle John has in 1 and 2 John. Uh, second thing you need to know about this phrase, what does, you know, what does Scripture say about the Antichrist? It says that it's anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ. That's verse 22 here in, in 1 John chapter 2. And that anyone who denies the Father and the Son, the latter part of verse 22 says that. that or that every spirit that does not confess Jesus in 1 John chapter 4 verse 3. Or those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh in 2 John chapter 7. Now specifically, that's who John is talking about here in 1 John chapter 2. We read, therefore we know that it's the last hour they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us they would have continued with us but they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us but you have been anointed by the holy one you all have knowledge and so john was writing about this these specific group of uh, false teachers the gnostics and we've talked a little bit about this as we've studied john's writing gnostics basically believed that uh, the flesh or the physical world was bad and that spiritual things were good. And so that was the dichotomy that they were working with. And so everything physical was, was evil, and there wasn't much you could do about it. You either uh, didn't have anything to do with the physical world, or you just succumbed to everything and did whatever you wanted in the physical, because it's evil, and it doesn't matter if you attain sort of this spiritual level, right? If you had this special knowledge, then what you did in the physical life didn't matter. They would go as far as to say, because the physical body was evil, that Jesus couldn't be, you know, the Christ on the cross, 
They, they would teach things like that at his baptism, the, you read about the dove coming down and God speaking, this is my son who, with whom I'm well pleased. And they say the Holy Spirit shows up and they, they would say that that's the anointing of Jesus and that the Christ was bestowed on Jesus, the physical person Jesus at that point. And then some point before his death on the cross, the Christ was taken away. Because, you know, the Messiah couldn't die a physical death. That would be evil. That would be bad. A physical body can't matter like that. And so they would literally teach that the Christ, Messiah, didn't come in the flesh. That it was, the Messiah was all spiritual. And that that spirit left Jesus at some point. And this is the Antichrist that John is talking about. Anyone who opposes Jesus, especially those who oppose Jesus as coming in the flesh. So, all that to say, uh, were there many Antichrists in, in John's day? Yeah, we'll, we'll take him at his word and we know that this is prevalent and they, they started in the church. One of the, one of the things you have to know is that, you know, John said they went out and so we know they're not of us, but we don't know at what point these folks, uh, you know, were, lived in the church and, and followed Jesus and at what point they said, we're heading out this direction. And then they did everything they could to lead people away from who Jesus really is. Are there many antichrists in the world today? Well, I think that, you know, that's obvious as well. That sure, there are people and and folks teaching all kinds of things to distract us from who Jesus really is and the difference that he really made in his church's life. Is it necessary for us to kind of pull off the mask and reveal this particular person at a particular point in history who will play this particular role? Uh, There are absolutely Bible scholars who believe there will be this antichrist at some point in the redemptive history uh, of God. I don't think that's necessary. I, I, I'm, you know, John says there's many antichrists. The enemy is going to use all kinds of people to lead folks away from Jesus. I'm not so sure of that myself, but, uh, y- you know, there could be. There could be at some point in time. And uh, what's the difference between uh, believers and these antichrists? Well, I think verse 20 uh, fills us in there. But you have been anointed by the Holy One and you have knowledge that, that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit and we have this relationship with Jesus, which really becomes the most important thing for us to, to focus on at this point. We, we don't have to wait for the mask to be pulled off of some villain in redemptive history. And in fact, we, you know, we, ought, to, we ought to pay attention to what's going on in the world around us and all of those things. Uh, that, that's true. But to focus on this one point probably misses the, the bigger promise. And, and that's question number two. What is Jesus' promise to us? Let's take a look at verse 24. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. I just love the way verse 24 begins because I'm, I'm a pretty simple guy. And, and to be honest, a lot of this, I, you, you know, the st- eschatology, the study of end times, you know, how that's going to play out. You know, Jesus promises us that we, we're not going to figure it out, that we don't have all the answers, and, and uh, I'm not smart enough to try, to try to convince you that I do. And so I love verse 24 because it's such, a, it boils it down for me. What should we do? Well, we should let what we have heard from the beginning abide in us. What is it that we've heard from the beginning? That God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That Jesus is God's son, that he's Messiah, that he entered this world, that he lived and ministered, that he healed and that he taught, and ultimately he goes to the cross to pay a price that I owe and can't afford on my own to pay. That he died on that cross, that he was buried in a tomb, And that he rose from the dead on that third day. You know, that's the story. That's the promise that we have heard from the beginning. And we we should let it abide in us. I I looked up some rules of etiquette. I was thinking about, uh, have you ever read rules of etiquette and then realized how rude you've been? 
You know, you just go through the list. Uh, I just looked up rules that you ought to teach your kids, uh, etiquette rules that you ought to teach, and some of these we really do a good job of, I think. I think most parents want their kids to say please and thank you. You know, you ought ought to be teaching your your kids to to look people in the eyes when they speak with them, right? To, to, To communicate in that way. You know, maybe you, my favorite on the list that I read was, uh, don't pick your nose in public. That's good information, right? That, that's, a, that's a fine rule of etiquette that we ought to follow. But have you ever discovered that you, you're breaking some rules of etiquette? For instance, when you sit down at the table and you, you put a napkin on your lap, you're, you're supposed to unfold that napkin completely in the rectangle shape so that it covers your entire lap. If you fold that napkin and it's kind of in a triangle, that's a breach of etiquette, right? You maybe break some of these rules of etiquette, and and it's not because you're you're trying to offend somebody, right? It's not because you want to upset someone. It's just because we we don't keep those rules of etiquette necessarily at the forefront of our minds. Those aren't the conversations we're having in our social circles of how you fold your napkin on your lap. We don't necessarily have those all of the time. And so we just sort of leave them behind a little bit. We, we forget them. We're just not paying close attention to them. And I think sometimes that's how we approach God's Word. We know it's important, but we just kind of set it aside And when we set it aside, we we get busy doing other things, and we we get distracted with other uh, priorities, and and we end up kind of leaving it behind, not because we want to offend the author of God's Word, not because we want to offend Him, but just because we're distracted by something else, just because it's not at the forefront of our minds, it's not in the conversations we're having in our social circles. And so when John says, let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you, that's this very simple truth. That if we want to honor God by following his word, by living that out in our life, now we have to keep it at the forefront of our minds. That's why uh, in a few weeks we'll begin a summer Bible reading plan. I was talking to Zach and Craig uh, last week, and I said, this is what I'm thinking about for a summer reading plan. I said, do you think it's too much? Is it too hard? Is it, is it just too difficult? And we kind of had a conversation about that. And I, th- In a few weeks we're going to begin the summer reading plan. It's going to be challenging, but keeping God's Word at the forefront of our minds, of studying it daily, having a personal time of worship, allowing his word to abide in us. Uh, It's so important. Where God's word is, that relationship with him will grow. That relationship with him will mature. One scholar said, if what you heard from the beginning, uh, or sorry, what... John was a scholar, and he said that. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and the Father. Where that word is, then our relationship will grow. Uh, This scholar said it's not enough merely to have heard it and assented to the message in time past. The message must continue to be present and active in the lives of those who have heard it. They must continually call it to mind and let it affect their lives. We need to keep what we have heard from the beginning in front of us and allow it to... uh, abide with us. And this is the promise, verse 25 says. When we abide with him, this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. Eternal life, that phrase is so important to John. He uses it all through his gospel. He talks about life and more specifically eternal life. From the beginning of his gospel in John chapter 1 verse 4 where he says Jesus came to give you life and to be the light of men. So he provides us with direction, with hope for the future and direction in the, the, the here and now. That eternal life begins right 
now. And Jesus wants to offer us direction. He, he tells us he wants us to experience life to the full, this abundant life that John talks about in John chapter 10, verse 10. Or in John chapter 17, verse 3, where he says, I, I'm giving you this life so that you will know the Father. This eternal life grows this relationship as we abide in him with the Son and with the Father. And, and that he, that's the, the message that John came, uh, writes his gospel to teach. And in John chapter 20, verse 31, he says, the reason I write this to you is so that you might believe and have life. This eternal life begins right now. Uh, the trick with eternal life is that sometimes we hold it out just for the future, that it's something that's going to happen later, and that's not what, what Jesus intends. That's not what John teaches. This light for the here and now, this relationship that we're growing with the Father through the Son, this abundant life that we can experience here and now uh, in relationship with Him. And, and what's more, we, we sometimes think of this future eternal life as, as sort of the the afterlife, right? We're not sure what that looks like. We're not sure how we'll experience that. And yet Jesus tells us how we will experience that. He tells us that this isn't just something that's sort of out there in the clouds that, that we'll, we'll, we'll experience in the spiritual realm. He ties it to this physical resurrection uh, to the dead, to his resurrection from the dead. In John chapter 5, uh, verses 26 to 29. John chapter 5, verses 26 uh, to 29, Jesus says this. He says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. And, and come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. We, we, we will experience this physical resurrection. And we know that this relationship is, is true and is right because we're sealed by His Holy Spirit. Verse 26 in 1 John chapter 2, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, but the anointing that you receive, that's the, that's the Holy Spirit sealing us, received from Him, abides in you. That's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so that abundant life comes through uh, the Holy Spirit making us new from the inside out and that growth and maturity that occurs when we abide in Him, when we keep His Word at the forefront of our mind, when we are, 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 are allowing it to, to get into our heart, when we meditate and memorize and know what God's Word, God's word says, our relationship with Jesus grows and matures. That's his promise to us. Eternal life that begins here, right now, today, that extends absolutely into eternity forever and ever and ever, and that brings about the recreation, the resurrection of our bodies, just like Jesus. Question number three is then what now? If we're not searching out that this guy that we have to pull the mask off of and determine who the bad guy is, you know, what do we do right now? Let's take a look at verse 28 here in 1 John chapter 2. And now, little children. I just love this because we return to this imagery of a family, of relationship, of being on the team. For sure, John is, is talking to this group of believers that are part of a church that look up to John as, as elder, right? They use that term in, in some of his other letters. And, and they look up to him as, as a, a apostle and as a church leader and as an uh, kind of elder statesman in the church, all those things, right? And so they are disciples of John. Well, it's more they're disciples of Jesus, though. And, and so I think this term of, of children ought to point us to the fact that we are a part of God's family, that we are children uh, of God, and that we have that security and that sense of belonging. No, no matter what happens around us, 
came home the other night, and uh, I think we were out at this school event, and we came home, and Cherry and I were sitting on the couch. We were watching a TV show, and we had our feet up, you know, it was that kind of time of day, time of night, and Zoe walked in the living room, and she said, what is wrong with you both? I thought, there's no telling. I, I don't know. What do, what do you mean? She said, you both have shoes on. And that is a little weird. You know, we, I kick my shoes off when we get home, and typically I'm sitting on the couch, my feet are up, I don't have shoes on. I didn't think it was that weird, right, to provoke this kind of reaction, but I can understand that. And, and I, you know, we have these cards that say, welcome home, because we really believe that, you know, we are part of God's family, and we want you to feel like you are home here, and that you are a part of that team and a part of his family, and, and, and I hope... All of us feel comfortable, but let's be honest. There are some things that we would do in our living room that we wouldn't do in this room, I hope. Right? There are some things we would do at home that we wouldn't do here. And there's just something about being home. And to me, that's what I hear. When I hear John describe us as little children, that we are just a part of his team, that we can, we can kick our shoes off no matter how bad the day has been, no matter what state those socks might be in, we can kick our shoes off and put our feet up because we are secure and happy and comfortable in his presence. We are home. And that's really what he says, and now little children, abide in him. Remember that word abide, so important in John's writings, it means make this home, stay here. Uh, The NIV uh, talks about it in terms like this, it says continue in him. The New Living Translation says remain in fellowship with Jesus. The message that, that I don't often go to, but I think the message really gets it right. It gets to the heart of the matter here in 1 John chapter 2 verse 28. It, it says live deeply in Jesus. Stick with him. Stay with him because we have to focus on him over and over and over every day and our relationship matures and grows. Uh, we, We know more and more about who he is and what he wants to do in our life. I was texting with my daughter, Lacey. She's a college student. She's studying nursing. And so she was writing this paper in in one of her classes about exercise and older adults exercising, what that should look like. And she's writing this paper and she said, I'm I'm kind of struggling. It's it's dragging on a little bit. I'm writing this paper about exercise for older adults. And so I'm very sensitive to this. I just send her this this video of uh, old ladies doing water aerobics right? This is what you're talking about. Just do this. Just say this. And she said, yeah, that's basically it. And so then I texted back, well, did you know your mom used to teach water aerobics? And she said, how did I not know this? And I said, well, you weren't alive. (laughs) You know, I, I I have these years that I've banked before Lacey was, in relationship with your mom. And, and she instantly said, are there pictures? And then I had to explain that there was a time in, in history when we didn't take pictures of everything. You know, that, that would have required, you know, me going to the pool and snapping pictures of these wonderful ladies doing water aerobics. And I just wasn't into that. I wasn't doing that. You know, that's not what the youth pastor probably needed to be doing. So, Oh, there's no pictures. There's no evidence. You're just going to have to take my word for it that I have this experience with your mom in the past, that this relationship has grown over years, that I have this, I I know things that maybe you don't know about her even. We, We need to abide in him and live in relationship with him so that we can continue to grow that relationship. And now little children abide in him. Why? So that when he appears, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. We may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Again, I think the message really gets to the heart of this matter. The message says uh, you need to abide in him so that you won't be red-faced with sin when Jesus appears. So that we won't be embarrassed by the choices we've made and the sin that exists in our life. 
And and the message goes on to say, so that you won't be red-faced in your sin and that you won't make lame excuses. If you won't make lame excuses for how you've spent this time waiting for Jesus. That, that what now? Well, that question, the answer to that question is very simple. We abide in him. We grow our relationship with Jesus so we know him more and more, so we live more and more like him. We spend our time focused on him and loving others like Jesus loves the church. So we won't be embarrassed by the sin present in our life. So we won't make lame excuses about how we've spent our time, about who we've tried to pull the mask off of, of of what we've been distracted by, that we will be focused on Him and loving others. Jesus is coming. That Greek word for, for coming, uh, it, it, uh, it, it's an interesting one. John doesn't use it a lot, but uh, it, it's a Greek word that, that talks about, uh, it literally meant the, the arrival of, of a political uh, emissary, like a, 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 a general returning from battle and the, the fanfare that surrounded that. You know, you think about when the president shows up somewhere, and no matter who the president is or what day it is, you know, the streets are shut down. There's police escorts. That, that's the only air, airplane coming into the airport for this period of time. That there's fanfare, this celebration, this big deal is made because the president is arriving in town. And that's how uh, the New Testament writers anticipated Jesus' return. That every knee will bow. And every tongue confess that you won't mistake. It won't be hidden. You, you, you won't miss it. That it's a, it's a celebration. Trumpets will sound. Scripture's pretty clear. We'll know when he returns. Don't be red-faced in sin. Don't make lame excuses for how you spend your time. Maybe the best thing about these uh, villains in movies, you know, that list of, of my favorite villains. Even you go back to Knight Rider. Knight Rider, there was this episode where Kit and Carr are facing off, and it, it concludes with this uh, crash in midair. They jump, and they hit each other, and there's this explosion. And what do you suppose happens? Right? The, the car, the bad guy, is destroyed, and Knight Rider kind of rides off into the sunset. Right, Every time we know this villain is going to lose, they are going to come up short. There's no reason for us to approach eschatology, the study of end times. There's no reason for us to approach a conversation about antichrists or the antichrist, about Jesus' return with trepidation or fear. As followers of him, We are on the winning side, and it's the most lopsided victory in all of eternity. Let's stand and worship him.